good evening and welcome to the Vincent Center seminar series in the classical political economy tradition. I'm Juan Castañeda, director of the Vincent Center at the University of Buckingham. May I start by thanking the, the IA uh, for hosting this event. So it was a pleasure to work with the, with the, with the IA. They are uh, partners of ours and very good friends. So thank you very much to everyone. Uh, tonight, I'm delighted uh, to be joined by two friends and excellent speakers who are not going to give a seminar, uh, uh, but to have a debate on a topic that, in my opinion, is not discussed enough and is not even supported by most self-denominated free marketeers. Uh, we'll be debating free trade, in particular whether the UK should be adopting unilateral free trade. That's the proposition, uh, regardless of what other economists do. Before I introduce the speakers, please allow me to talk you through the, the format for tonight, very brief, briefly. Um, first, uh, it will be for the proposition, Daniel Hannan will start uh, uh, talking again for the proposition, the UK should be adopting unilateral free trade for 10 minutes. That will be followed by Terence Kelly with another uh, 10 minutes against the proposition. And then I will be putting two questions uh, to each of them, and each of them they will be having the opportunity to comment uh, on, each, uh, on each question. That will take us um, roughly uh, uh, through the first hour of the debate. They will, then I will be opening the debate to the floor for 15 or 20 minutes, and then we should be finished by 6.30, and you should be having the opportunity to vote uh, for or against the proposition. Uh, you should know that we are recording this event, so to be recorded both the presentations, the debate, and the questions uh, from the audience. Uh, so now to our speakers, very briefly, if I may. Uh, Daniel Hannan, Laura Hannan, uh, is an author and columnist. Uh, he serves on the UK uh, Board of Trade and is a vice chairman of the Conservative Party responsible for its international relations. He teaches at the University of Buckingham and the University of Francisco Marroquin in Guatemala. He has written nine books, including the New York Times bestseller, Inventing Freedom, How the English-Speaking Peoples Made the Modern World. He sat as Conservative MEP for 21 years and was a founder of Vote Leave. He writes regular columns for, among others, The Sunday Telegraph, The Washington Examiner, and Conservative Home. Daniel is also the president of the Institute for Free Trade, hosted by the Vincent Center at the University of Buckingham. Professor Terence Keeley trained in medicine at Barts and in biochemistry at Oxford. Between 1986 and 2000, he lectured in clinical biochemistry at Cambridge. Between 2001 and 2014, he was vice chancellor at, at the University of Buckingham, since when he has been a research fellow at the Cato Institute in Washington, D.C. In recent years, he has published a number of papers with Martin Ricketts, Professor Ricketts, that recognize knowledge as tacit and which therefore describes science not as a public good, but as a contribution good. So let's start, please. Uh, uh, Daniel, the floor is yours for the first 10 minutes, please. Well, Juan, thank you very much. Uh, very grateful to the Vincent Center and to the IA for hosting us. Let me begin in deference to Terence's distinguished, uh, enormously distinguished medical background by inviting you to join me in a little thought experiment. Suppose that somebody invented a pill that would allow you to live in perfect health until the age of 120 and then die peacefully and painlessly. Such a pill, I put it to you, would put a lot of people out of work. It would be bad news for doctors and nurses. It would be catastrophic for the care home industry. It would be extremely bad news for the medical insurance industry. But would anyone regard those as valid arguments not to allow the pill to circulate? Now, ladies and gentlemen, here's the kicker. Would it make any difference whether that pill had been invented in your own country or somebody else's? All of the arguments for protectionism and mercantilism boil down to ways of prohibiting the free circulation of that pill. Right? Maybe not exactly that pill, but some other product that we find beneficial or that boosts our pleasure or utility. Anything that gives us a more pleasant life that we want to get you need to have a pretty good reason to come between the seller and the buyer. And the fact that the seller and the buyer are in different countries does not strike me 
as a good reason. Now, of course, the argument is never put in those terms by the protectionist and mercantilist interest. Rather, they will phrase their objections in what sound like much more plausible terms. They will use phrases that are designed to come across as common sense because they appeal to our intuitions. They appeal to our inner caveman, if you will. So they'll say things like, we can't carry on with a big trade deficit. Or, you know, We have to produce our own food. It only makes sense to feed ourselves. You know, we, we have to protect strategic. I'm all for free trade as long as it's fair trade. Or, or we have to protect our infant industries. All of these things sound like common sense. All of them turn out to be specious. All of them, when translated into policy, serve to make a country needlessly poor. So why do we keep hearing them generation after generation? Precisely because they are intuitive. In the literal sense, they speak to instincts and intuitions buried deep in our DNA. We did not evolve in this world of superabundance and skyscrapers. In our genetic code, we're still roaming the savannas of Pleistocene Africa. We have the instincts of a hunter-gatherer people. We want to have a stash of food nearby. It gives us the reassurance that we're going to be able to make it through the winter. The notion of depending on strangers for stuff that we can't yet see does not come naturally. And yet, if we give in to those caveman intuitions, we always end up being penurious. And I say always advisedly. It was in 1824 that the great Whig historian, poet, uh, and Indian administrator and politician Lord Macaulay said, free trade, one of the greatest benefits that a government can bestow upon a people is in every country unpopular. Right? 1824, think of the extraordinary advances in human prosperity that we've had in those exactly 200 years. And yet there has never been a moment in those 200 years when free trade has been popular. Why? Because, as I say, we are a, we're a tribal species, we're a hunter-gatherer species, and we all tend to begin with our gut intuition and then reason backwards and convince ourselves of something that may not be logical. Now, I don't believe that anyone is born a free trader. It's precisely these gut intuitions that you can, if you like, educate people out of. I certainly did not begin. I'd be surprised if anyone in this room began with some intuitive knowledge of, you know, Ricardian comparative advantage. In fact, I remember the first time when I was an undergraduate that somebody talked me through the David Ricardo thesis. And the first time I heard it, I thought, no, that can't be right. And I kept going back looking for a flaw. How can it possibly be the case that if another country can outcompete you at everything, if they have relative and absolute advantages in everything over you, I can see that free trade is good for them. How can it possibly be good for you? Right. And yet, of course, Ricardo shows that it, it must mathematically be the case. By the way, one of the happiest truths in economics, it means you can just sit back on your bum and get richer as long as the other guy's productivity improves. I don't know why we find that such a difficult idea. It's, a, it's, a, it's an incredibly happy fact about the world, but it doesn't come naturally. Paul Samuelson, the Nobel Prize winning economist, famously said, it's the only idea in economics that is both surprising and true. Right? And, and, and so every generation struggles with this. But that is, of course, precisely the function of think tanks like this one and uh, uh, of universities like Buckingham. It's to teach people the counterintuitive truths. Those are the things that once you've seen, you can't unsee. And so if only for the sake of, not, not, in, the, not in the belief that it's going to convince a majority, because just as in Macaulay's day, it never will, because people will still go with their hunches. But for the record, let's run through what it is that unrestricted commerce has done. First of all, most obviously, it has made people much richer. It is an incredibly powerful eliminator of poverty. Something like six or 700 people have been lifted out of extreme poverty since I started talking. That's six or 700 arguments for globalization since I began. New arguments, right? Because uh, it, it, the, the falls in poverty, the real uh, increases in living standards over the last 30, 40 years have been precisely in the, particularly those Asian and African countries that have dropped autarky and joined the global market system. There is then, of course, a, a rather overlooked argument, but the original argument for it, which is it makes 
people get on better. Free trade is an extraordinarily good way of making wars a bit less likely. Now, no one, sadly, has come up with a way of eliminating war. I wish somebody could, but man is fallen and there are always going to be abuses and conflicts. But when you try and correlate rises and falls in, in violence, in armed war, with any other factor, democracy or the rule of law, the one that you are closest to is free commerce. For, for, for the reasons that, you know, uh, Cobden and Bright set out when they were campaigning for it in the 19th century, which is, first of all, free trade removes the need for conflict. If everyone can buy assets on the same terms, if the, if the product is available to everyone, then it ceases to matter whose country it's in. And second, it, it raises the costs of conflict because, uh, as Russia is finding at the moment, once you engage in a war and remove yourself from the global system, you pay a much heavier cost than if you were an autarkic country. So there is a, 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 there is a functional reason free trade makes us richer. There is a pacifying reason. It is a remarkably apt tool for poverty and immigration. Uh, sorry, for, for, for conflict resolution. But there is also a straightforward moral case, and that is to do with freedom and free contract. The great thing about free trade is that it cuts out the middle. It means that if you have a good idea and you have something that the rest of the world wants, nobody comes between you and them and makes it illegal. Now, I come back to that magic pill. All of the arguments on the other side about, oh, what about devastated communities and, you know, we need to support working people and all this, they are all ways of making the pill more expensive. They are all, in other words, a way of privileging a minority, usually a politically connected minority or a minority that has a powerful trade union that is politically connected, at the expense of the general population. When Donald Trump slapped on his sugar tariffs, yes, he was propping up a few uh, growers in, in Florida, but hugely to the cost of all downstream industries in confectionery and food processing. When he had his steel tariffs against China, he was destroying many more jobs in construction, in car making, and indeed making ordinary consumers poorer in order to privilege one particular sectional interest. And so when people say, look, free trade is all very well, but sometimes we, we have to think of the national interest, I would just come back and say, what do you mean by the national interest? If by the national interest, you mean the interest of the nation as a whole, then the only way of pursuing it is to take the government's thumb off the scales and allow people to make whatever moral choice they want as a free individual. I repeat, you want to sell me that bill, I want to buy it. You need a very good reason to come between us. And as long as you are encouraged to be selling it to the widest number of people without any considerations of caste or creed or race or nationality, you are having to think yourselves into the minds of your customers. And so trade serves to make us more empathetic, draws us into harmonious, natural, organic networks instead of having to look up to the state for privileges and for special favors. In short, free trade, as well as making us better off, makes us better people. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Um, so, tap. Terence, your 10 minutes against the proposition. Please. Thank you. Um, just to take your last point first, the idea that uh, trade is a source of peace. That was, of course, a very commonly held view in 1914, uh, and it didn't show out to be such a good idea. And in fact, Adam Smith specifically said that trade was a source of warfare. He talked about that, progressing that. But let's go back to your idea of the pill, because what we're talking about here is unilateral free trade. Um, the question is, um, should the pill, that you've, your magical pill, be made only in one country and sold globally, and therefore all the profits go to only one country? Or should other people be allowed to make these pills themselves? Now, I, I'm very sad to hear that um, my, the paper that I wrote um, only got to you all at two o'clock this afternoon. But um, what I've done is I've reproduced the graphs of the paper that you all have a copy of, and I'm going to introduce a point from Albert Einstein. 
Albert Einstein said that it's theory that determines what you observe. And the theory that Dan is talking to is the theory that the larger the market, the greater the competition, prices come down and competition is increased. And that is the theory of Adam Smith, that's the theory of David Ricardo, and it's the theory of all modern trade theory. There is a problem with that theory because what it does, it molds exactly as Dan has done. It means that you start thinking in a particular way. But growth in the real world is not achieved by that model. Growth in the real world is achieved by research and development if you're a rich country and by copying if you're a poor country. And so the reality is, and if I can just ask you just to look at these graphs very quickly, so you see the first graph here. At the bottom, you have GDP per capita for all the countries in the world. And on the left, the share of GDP they spend on research and development. And the richer the country, the more it spends on research and development. And then if you go to the graph over the page, same countries, the richer the country, the tighter its pattern rights and the poorer the country, the looser its pattern rights. So what this tells you is that the mechanism of economic growth is different in rich and poor countries. Rich countries get richer by research and development. Poor countries get richer by copying the technology of the rich countries. If you allow free trade, completely free trade, between rich and poor countries, what do you get? You get the rich countries saying, we no longer have to engage in R&D against our competitors. We can employ cheap labor in the third world, either directly or through uh, employing them in factories and importing their goods. Equally, entrepreneurs in the third world say to themselves, if you have completely free trade, we can't compete against the products of the West. They're completely better than ours. But what we can do is forget about training up our staff and focus on making them as cheap as possible to sell goods as cheaply as possible into the West. And so the incentive to do research and development and the incentive to increase productivity is completely destroyed by the appearance of cheap labor. And that is the real criticism of free trade in that it drives everything down to the price of the cheapest labor. But it doesn't increase productivity. It actually destroys productivity because it removes the incentive to do either R&D or to copy. Now, if you understand economic growth as occurring through this embodiment of ideas, then you recognize that economic growth is a matter of the nation investing in its own human cap. But if you go to Dan's ideas, everyone is reduced to the price of the cheapest labor because that is where the profits could be made. Now, that may sound theoretical and hypothetical, but that's exactly what the world has shown. Uh, the Trump phenomenon absolutely grew out of the fact that in America, the China shock put so many people out of employment and lowered the salaries of so many other people. And you see the same phenomenon in Europe. You also see, well, chronicle, that where areas have suffered particularly from imports, that's where the votes for Brexit or Trump, whatever, are their highest. But the idea that by restricting trade so that you can't go for cheap labor is borne out by um, the table, table one, which is the next page. And this shows you on the, this America for the last hundred years, on the left, you have the average annual growth of productivity in America. And the highest rate of productivity growth in America is the 1930s. The 1930s, when rates of productivity growth were three times higher than they are today. And of course, there was absolutely no free trade in the 1930s. And if you look on the right-hand column, you see the share of GDP spent on exports, but this is the same for imports and set globalization. That is to say, the entrepreneur in America over the last 100 years, but everywhere, has a simple choice. He or she, faced with competition, can either go and do research to try to improve their products, or if they're in the third world, copy as best they can 
the products of the West, to grow the productivity of their people. But if cheap labor offers itself, then you say, to hell with all of that. And as Ross Perot said when he heard the sound of all the jobs going out of Mexico in 1992, we're not going to compete, we're going to let productivity go to hell, and we're just going to make the cheapest goods we can from the cheapest labor. And it simply comes down to an economic argument. Technology and labor are substitutes. You can go for one or the other. And the empirical evidence of the United States of America, but there's tons of it, shows the less trade there is, the more each nation is thrown into its own human resources, the more it invests in its own people, the greater the productivity grows and the richer and happier everybody is. But the more that people can just import either cheap labor or the product of cheap labor, the more they say, to hell with the human labor of this country. I'm just going to import cheap goods from China this year and Vietnam next year and Cambodia the following year. And everybody's standards of living fall, including in the third world, ironically, compared to where it would have been, because the entrepreneurs in the third world are now no longer interested in building up the human capital of their staff. They're just trying to exploit the cheapest labor they can get hold. And so the argument against free trade is not, as Dan says, because Dan has a model, and I go back to Einstein's statement, that it's the model that determines what you see. For Dan, the bigger the market, the greater the competition, the better everything else. But the reality is that rich and poor countries get richer in different ways. And if you treat them all the same, then what you actually get is crowding out of everything apart from the exploitation of cheap labor. And the irony is that even in the third world, the cheap labor remains cheap under free trade because there's no incentive to grow cheap labor's human capital and make it be able to make sophisticated goods. The incentive is now, let's make the cheapest possible goods we can, and therefore we'll disincentivize, even in the third world, the um, education of our folk. Now, obviously, it is not an absolute. Obviously, there are standards of living rising. But um, the tendency has been against that. Um, the rates of rising of human capital have been slower than they otherwise would have been. And contrary to what Dan says, it's been a huge increase in inequality, particularly, of course, in the first world, as work, working people, but also middle class people, have been undermined by the cheap products that are coming from the third world, and, of course, the mobility of capital, which has meant that we have produced a small Davos attending class that have alienated everybody else with their extraordinary wealth. So the Trump vote is as much middle class as working class, as the free movement of capital has reinforced the enrichment of a minority superclass, just as the workers have been in, in relatively impoverished by the free movement of goods made by cheap labor in cheap Thank you, Terence. Um, so what I'm gonna do now is to put a, a couple of questions to each of you, and then I will give you the opportunity to comment on each other's uh, answer. So Daniel, may, may I start with you? Uh, so you made uh, a very clear argument uh, in favor of free trade based on uh, the net wealth uh, gains uh, coming from, from, from trade. And yet, uh, I'm pretty sure we can identify winners and losers from trade. Have you considered how to compensate those who lose uh, the most on trade? Thank you. Uh, well, let me first of all just make the en passant comment that the one thing that the Davos class are not in favor of is free trade. Uh, completing his transition to outright bond villain. Klaus Schwab last week said that there are these terrible people who are against the entire system. They're called libertarians and they're against everything we believe, right? Which is true. I mean, there's they, the, the, the ultimate confederation of rent seekers. Uh, and they would, I, I'm pretty sure that they would not be voting with me uh, tonight. But, uh, okay, let's, let's address exactly that point about the winners and the losers. Uh, Terence put it in terms of the China shock to the US. First of all, I, I, I dispute the premise. Uh, blue collar workers, working class men in America now earn a third more in real terms than their fathers did. There has been an increase in employment and there has been an increase in real wages. Uh, the, 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 it, it, uh, of course, these things are always patchy, but let's keep an eye on the figures. Uh, opponents of trade in the US point to supposedly 120,000 jobs a year lost because of competition with China. Even if we take that figure at face value uncritically, it is a rounding error 
when we consider that 60 million jobs every year are lost because of technological advance, and a greater number of jobs is created every year because of technological advance. The reason that you have some high unemployment black spots is not because of trade with China, but because of technological change that allows a, a smaller number of people to get more stuff than previously required a mass workforce. If anything, there was a study in 2017 that showed that the industries most exposed to trade with China have created slightly more jobs than those uh, that are not so exposed. Now, it is true that some of the factory jobs have disappeared uh, because of robotics, because of technology. By the way, robotics and technology that are also affecting China. The idea that China is a, a cheap workforce economy is not true. The Chinese workforce for manufacturing peaked in 2013, has been in decline for a decade because of the same robotics revolution there and now AI revolution as everywhere else. But it is true that factory jobs are disappearing. What's replacing them? Not more factory jobs, but better jobs, better and better paid jobs in research, in marketing, and so on, as we move up the production chain and as some of our jobs are left to machines. If I can just finish with a, with a, a, a personal um, reflection. I, I was in politics, as Juan said in introducing me. I, I represented the southeast of England for 21 years. And I will frankly admit that the southeast of England was not, in general, an area with a lot of heavy industry. Never had been. Uh, with one exception, however, uh, which was the big dockyard in Chatham, which followed the same pattern as other heavy industry in this country. It employed 12,000 plus people at peak. Uh, it closed, I think, in 1984, at exactly the time that the steel mills and the coal mines were closing across the Midlands and the North. And there were still, when I was the MEP, people who were angry about that. And, and I don't blame them. You could actually, you could, you could tell very often by their physique the, the tragic story of their lives. A, a man who has had an active physical job and then suddenly loses it doesn't have the same technique as somebody who has been lazy uh, all his life, if you see what I mean. The, the, and, and, and they, you know, they'd give me the... the, the you know, the evil witch Margaret Thatcher, she hated the working class. I would, I, who wouldn't be angry if you if you had a perfectly good job as a welder and you, you lost it in your 40s or, uh, and, and then you were going to be a security guard, right? But it is only fair to tell that story right through to the end. Going into the pandemic, the unemployment rate in the constituency that contained the shipyard at Chatham was 1.2%. There are more people now working on the territory that was covered by the shipyard than when it was a shipyard. What are they doing? Some of them, I regret to say, are at Medway University, and some of them are doing sort of heritage tourism, but the biggest employer there is the audiovisual industry. It's where we make Sherlock. It's where we make Call the Midwife. The grandsons of those guys who were bashing metal for a living are now tapping at computer screens. My maternal grandfather was a shipyard worker in the west of Scotland on the Clyde. He had a typically unhealthy, blue-collar, West of Scotland lifestyle. He smoked heavily. He didn't eat a very good diet, so he died when he was incredibly young. 60, 61. So I never met him. So I never had the chance to ask him whether he would have wanted to have kept that shipyard open at whatever cost to taxpayers or consumers. But I have a pretty shrewd idea that if he could see what my cousins and I do for a living instead of bashing metal, he wouldn't hesitate. Thank you, Daniel. So now is your opportunity, Terence, to um, uh, comment on that answer or to question uh, Daniel. Look, of course, the whole point of technology is it creates new jobs. Losing jobs to cheap labour abroad, however, is a net loss to that society. We are not doubting, none of us can doubt, that since 1830 in the Western world, standards of living has risen on average by about 2% a year for the last 200 years. The point is, do the trends shift? when you allow cheap labour to allow entrepreneurs to substitute cheap labour for technology? And the answer is the trends do shift. So all that you're describing is all very excellent and actually is wonderful, but it would have been faster if we had allowed research and development and the free flow of knowledge to have been accelerated rather than to have allowed this escape into essentially importing cheap goods from abroad. And that is the fundamental problem with your model. You have the opportunity to answer uh, just for one minute, please, and then I'll. Comparative advantage applies to labour as to anything else. When the UK 
embraced unilateral free trade from the 1840s onwards. It embraced trade with countries with much cheaper labor. Right? The, the idea that this is some hitherto unencountered situation is nonsense. Uh, you know, David Ricardo expressly addressed what he called the, the, the false argument of pauper labor. And what happened? What happened is that we got not only much richer than any other country and became actually the first country where ordinary people began to live well. It was the thing that most astonished foreign visitors to Victorian Britain. But we became an incredibly inventive country. The number of things that we were developing and patenting throughout the 19th century was increasing, even though we had, if you like, all the uh, opportunity to outsource to cheaper uh, places. Why? Because of comparative advantage. Uh, if, if comparative advantage means that even if the other guy is better, you know, let me put it like this. Churchill was a great bricklayer, right? He Look at the trowelmanship on that wall, if, if, if trowelmanship is a word, uh, 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 that he built around his house in Kent, right? If at the height of the Second World War he had needed a bit of work done in his house, it would still have made sense for him to get a builder in, right? even though he, Churchill, could have done a better job in absolute terms than the builder. Why? Because his comparative advantage was as a speechwriter, a politician, and ultimately a war leader. And ultimately, that is the same argument, whether we're talking about uh, products or whether we're talking about labor. It doesn't matter if the other guy has cheaper labor. You are freed up to do other stuff. And as prices fall in your country, you have more income which you can now, and more time, which you can now use for other purposes, creating markets for stuff that no one had thought of. And that is what drives the growth of the entire economy. We embraced free trade when we were the richest country in the world. Uh, previous to us, the Dutch were the richest country in the world, and they embraced free trade. The richest country in the world always embraces free trade because the balance of advantage is in their interests. You can destroy more foreign markets by the goods you produce than the ones that you lose for the reasons that you've just described. When the Dutch believed in free trade, we were absolutely protectionist until our markets had reached the level of the Dutch. And it continues with America and Britain today. So what you're describing is the phenomenon that the richest country in the world is always believer in free trade because it's in their interests and everyone else should be protecting themselves from that and simply dealing with the free movement of ideas. The movement of ideas is what actually benefits the world that you have described, not movement of goods. You want the capacity to be able to copy those ideas and employ your own people to make them yourself rather than to lose your markets to foreigners. If you look at developing countries and you can do like with like comparisons of where one country has adopted a free market model and the other one has a free trade model and the other, Colombia versus Venezuela or East Pakistan versus West Pakistan, you know, Pakistan versus Bangladesh, you find that free trade is your golden ticket to quicker development. What you actually find, if you look at those studies, is it's corruption that is undermining the mercantile economy. The mercantile economy is easily the best economy that you can have. It's the one that the Washington Consensus recommended. It's the one that Adam Smith recommended. Even uh, Paul Krugman is now talking about it. Now, the mercantile economy, and I illustrated in the paper, is example is, for example, Mauritius, a very poor island country, African uh, that 40 years ago started on this fantastic growth is now, of course, one of the richest countries in Africa. And what Mauritius did was a classic mercantile strategy, complete protection so that their infant industries could grow with the exception of intermediate goods, in this case, textiles that they imported for free, in, in sense of no tariffs, that they made up into clothes that they then sold into the Western world, taking advantage of their cheap labor. They didn't even make the raw material. They imported the raw material. What Mauritius did was a classic example of mercantilism because that is the best way of growing a third world country in the sense that you want to export as much as possible and import as little as possible so that you can then grow your infant industries. What makes Mauritius work and these other examples that you've given fail is corruption. Mauritius was not a corrupt country. The countries that you described are. And if you look at Washington Consensus, if you look at Adam Smith, they make the point explicitly. The best way of running an economy is in a mercantile fashion where you control your imports and exports to ensure that you protect your home industries and grow them. Unfortunately, that requires an honest government. Forgive me. One, I just, one, one, just one, on Mauritius, one, very, very quickly. One, one minute, please. One minute. Uh, that is not why Mauritius got rich. It absolutely is. But Mauritius, 4% of the Mauritian economy is 
agriculture, mainly sugar, which is almost as protected as in the United States. 74% of the Mauritian economy is services, by far the biggest being tourism. And that is, is not protected. What has made them rich is globalizing their tourism section. Uh, one second, Terence. Uh, do you mind if we close uh, uh, this section now? And then I'll give you the opportunity to, to close the next, uh, next one, I promise. So, Terence, actually, this question is, is for you, please. Can you give us an example or different examples of economies, successful economies, which have not embraced uh, free trade, please? Well, now or historically? I, I... Uh, look at the United States of America. You think the United States of America grew behind free trade? You think we competed with Holland against free tra by free trade? No successful developing country, apart from countries like Singapore, that aren't industrialized nations, they're just entrepreneurs, has ever succeeded by having free trade. They have all, without exception, had protectionism until such time as their industries have been able to compete. We come back to Mauritius. Mauritius became rich on the back of a protected textile industry. Latterly, of course, it has now embraced tourism. But what made Mauritius rich was a highly protected textile industry. And there's no pretense. Mauritius is proud of having been a successful mercantile nation. But to answer your question, with the exception of entrepôts or gambling dens like Macau, all industrialized nations grew initially behind protection. That is just a statement of historical fact. And so I, I, the, the, the flaw in that infant industries argument is that it depends on the government knowing which are the industries of the future and showing a wisdom that they never show in their day-to-day -day dealings on any other subject and being able to forecast where the growth is going to come. Now, occasionally, by the law of averages, they will do that but they will always end up doing it less than if it was let, allowed to happen on its own. Uh, there, I mean, the, the classic example of this, which is always the one that they, they, they teach in economics courses, was the, the Brazilian attempt to foster a computer industry in the 1980s by having high tariff rules. The trouble with the infant industry's argument is that it infantilizes the industry. It stops the industry needing to develop. It, in fact, weakens it. Ronald Reagan put it beautifully when he said, instead of protectionism, we should call it destructionism, because it's what stops our, our, the, the industries that you're interested in from becoming strong and competitive and able to flourish uh, uh, on global terms. You, I think your, your question, though, uh, Juan, was, can we name a, an example? I mean, look, it just, just, a, 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 it, just the illustrative purposes, I think it's really interesting to look at the examples from the two ends of the spectrum, because often that's a nice way of proving a point. The most protectionist country in the world is North Korea, where import substitution and self-sufficiency, juche, have been elevated to be the ruling principle of policy. And North Korea is the last place on the planet where you still have man-made famines. At the other end of that spectrum is Singapore, about which Ter Terence is so uh, dismissive. Singapore, that embraced free trade almost the moment it became independent from the, the Malaysian Federation. Singapore is a successful industrial as well as services economy. Dyson just moved to Singapore. They didn't move for low wage. In fact, Jim Dyson said to me, the one thing that no one can accuse me of doing is moving from Britain to Singapore because I'm after cheap liquor. I found one of the few places where uh, the, the, the wage cost is substantially higher. But because it has embraced free trade, because it gives him access to global markets, it was still a package that he preferred to what was on offer elsewhere. Uh, Terence, I really must come back on that thing. What makes these countries grow successfully initially is the protection of their infant industries. Uh, otherwise, there would be no industry to grow. Um, and I just come back to Mauritius because you, you, you came back to me on that. Mauritius became rich on the back of textiles that then moved successfully into service industries. And that's the classic story. Singapore is a very different story. As you, you see on the graph there, Singapore is a complete outlier when it comes to research and development. Singapore doesn't do R&D because it's a service industry and it's an entrepreneur. It is not an industrialized nation. It's absolutely not an example for an industrialized nation like ourselves. And for all that, you give the example of Brazil. Brazil has many problems of which a lack of successfully getting an IT industry is actually one of the minor ones because it's a deeply corrupt country. I don't want to be rude about Brazil. The, um, I just revert to the question that um, Juan asked me, and I asked me, and I revert to the data of People like Washington Consensus, people like Adam Smith. The way to grow is through mercantilism, and only if your politicians are corrupt do you have to revert to free trade. But it's a second choice option. It's not a matter of picking winners. It's a matter of the government working with industry to understand industry's needs. It's not a matter of the government leading industry. It's a matter of the government listening to industry. And where that happened, as it happened in Victorian England, for example, 
it worked extremely well. Please, Daniel, if you want to, your minute, and then uh, Terence Worthy comes in. I, I'll give Terence Paul Krug, uh, but but I will not yield Adam Smith. Uh, it, 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 it is, I think, a profound misreading of the Sage of Kirkcaldy to make out that he was wobbly on this. And actually, again, he put it very powerfully by giving a, a, an extreme example. He said it would be perfectly possible by means of greenhouses and hotbeds and hot walls to grow vines in Scotland. And he said from such vines, we might be able to produce a wine at around 30 times the price that you could produce wine in Bordeaux. He said, would anyone regard it as reasonable to prohibit the importation of claret in order to foster a wine industry in Scotland? And ultimately that, however it's phrased, all of the clever arguments that you, you, you get, I mean, whether it's uh, what we've heard from Terence about uh, tech or whether it's, it, it's about strategic industries or whether it's about jobs, they all come down to making stuff more expensive so that you can privilege one industry over the general population. It's all a way of making it harder for you to get that bill. Your clubs. Um, what Adam Smith actually said was, if you have a completely honest government, like the government in Amsterdam or the government in Venice, then you can have mercantilism. He actually specifically said that. But we don't have honest government in Britain. Therefore, we have to have free trade because the alternative is the corruption that we have, the old corruption, he called it. But his ideal, he explicitly said that, Amsterdam, Venice know how to run a mercantile economy because they are honest. And the whole point of running an economy is to benefit, because every economy is part of a nation, is to benefit the ordinary folk of that nation. What you try to do is you try to invest in the human skills and research of your people. What you don't want to do is to undermine that by taking away their markets with products from abroad, particularly produced by cheap labour. It's a matter of, do you want your labour to be well paid or do you want it to be less well paid? Now, it's absolutely true in recent years in America, basically because they've been printing money like water. God knows what the ultimate cost of that's going to be. There has been, of course, a tremendous recovery in the American economy. Thanks to this amazing debt that they built up, they have, of course, the one sovereign economy, currency. It's, it's bizarre. But if you look at the last 30 years before that in America, it was a world in America of increasingly impoverished middle, actually, as well as working class people. That has now expressed itself in support for a man who is not far short of being a fascist. You cannot dissociate lower prices and lower wages from the political consequences of those things. And the whole point of your model, Dan, and it's exactly what Bonnese said 100 years ago, if you have free trade, you drive everybody's salaries down to those, the cheapest people on the planet. Well, thank you. Uh, we're going to move on to the third question. So, Daniel, can you think of um, any exceptions to your um, proposition to, to support free trade? Any strategic sectors in the economy you just mentioned that we need to preserve? Well, there's always, uh, as I say, by the law of averages, you can always find examples of companies that have flourished despite protectionism because the circumstances were right, the technology was right, they were in the right place. So, you know, you, you can look at examples of sort of car companies in Japan or whatever and say they did all right, even though there was a tariff. True. Uh, my contention is that on balance, it must always be better to have allowed them to grow on their own. And I think the logic here is ineluctable. Either they are a company that you failed to identify, you, you, you picked a loser, in which case they do not deserve protectionism. You're, you're uh, misallocating resources to the wrong field, generally for political reasons. Or you happen to have one that would have done well anyway, in which case they didn't need it. Either way, the government is wrong to intervene. There is so I, 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 just because you can find uh, some example of where it worked out, uh, it doesn't mean it was a, it was a bad idea. By the way, I, I, I just it's 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 sort of linked to the topic, but I really do want to take on the idea that we've all you know that the, that that people on on ordinary incomes in the West are worse off than they were twenty or thirty years ago. I, this is so often repeated that that I think we started swallowing it without stopping to consider it. Um, Terence, like me, is old enough to remember how we lived 
in the 90s and the early 2000s with no wiki, with no Wi-Fi, where instead of one of these, you had a great big camera with rolls and you had, you know, this has replaced not just my my phone, but my chess set, my, you know, my compass, my radio, my my record collection, my, my library. You know, when people say that workers in the West are worse off, they are looking at only one thing which is the relative value of wages to capital. Well, it is true that the entry into the global market of hundreds of millions of workers from formerly communist countries made uh, a, a you know, changed that equation. But the flip side of it is that life was getting better because stuff was getting cheaper. And I would love some of those economists who tell us that we're all worse off to go back to that world where there were no cheap flights, there was no, you know, Ryanair, there was no... Uh, you know, uh, entertainment was four channels on TV and maybe a blockbuster video. You know, that the coffee was watery and terrible. That You know, I'd love to let them live a week in the late 90s or the early 2000s and then come back and tell us that we're all worse off than we were then. The share of the economy since the start of globalization that went to the workers as opposed to capital, as you know, because I know you know this, has gone by 10% of GDP. That is to say 10% of British GDP with the onset of globalization that used to go to the working classes now goes to the owners of capital. That is a huge shift of wealth from one group to another. What we are really talking about free trade is you're trying to say, how do we compensate for being too small in the economy? If you look at people like Schumpeter, he said, if you have a continental sized economy, such as America or the EU, you don't need free trade at all. In fact, Schumpeter said, if you have 200 million people, whatever the size of America was, you don't need trade because you can be completely self-sufficient apart from commodities. You need trade because you're small and because you're small, you can't be self-sufficient. And the trick is to use trade in such a way that you don't lose more from it than you can gain. Because as those graphs show, trade can destroy your, 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 your research, your development and your education. And so what you do is you engage in mercantilism. You say to countries that have different standards of living from yourself, we'll give you cheap food if you give us cheap IT. You talk about that. That is nothing compared to aeroplanes. Of course we have technology today, but we'd have had that technology because it's been growing since 1830. The question is, how has globalization been unfair to ordinary folk in the West, which is our concern, but also actually in the third world, and the empirical evidence is very clear. 10% of GDP that used to go to working people now goes to capital. There's been a huge increase, a huge imbalance of equality in the, third, in the Western world. Now, you and I both know that two weeks ago, The Economist ran article after article after article about this new paper coming out that says the rate of increase of inequality is much less than people have thought, although that paper itself was defective. I won't go into the details now, but for example, the authors of the paper didn't recognize that in this new electronic world, you can't now hide your income by taking cash. You have to report it. And therefore, the incomes of the poor have apparently grown more than we otherwise knew. But you cannot deny, Dan, surely, that the shift, you, in fact, you said it yourself, the shift of national income shared between capital and labor has hugely increased in benefit of capital because labor has been undercut by the global market. And the flip side of that is everything is cheaper. So you can live better with working the same number of hours, or you can live at the same standard working a shorter number of hours or some combination of the two. Technological development is inevitable once you have markets. The question is, is the technological development equitable or inequitable? Does it lead, as we have seen in Europe, and it's not just technology, of course, it's immigration, so we mustn't be naive about Europe, but country after country in Europe has been voting for fascist or near-fascist leaders. In America, who, Trump, we, we all know the example, but it's also Brazil, which you're so keen on, and other third world countries. We are seeing the global rise of fascism. And when we see a global rise of fascism, you have to ask yourself, why is this? And if you ask people, you've got Steve Bannon explained it very well. Steve Bannon is a fascist and he supports a fascist. And he said, we support Mr. Trump. He didn't say I'm a fascist. He said, I support Mr. Trump because, and he just gave all the reasons. Middle class people and working class people don't get as much share of income as they used to. And he went through all the other reasons why he's a populist. Your world has created... I, 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 I just don't recognise it. So first of all, I'm, I, I mean, I love Brazil, but I'm no fan of Brazilian politics, just to be clear. I'm no supporter of, of, of either Lula or of, of Bolsonaro. But I do not recognise the world that Bannon 
and that Trump is, and now you turn uh, uh, describing this world of, uh, I mean, yes, of course, in every society, you will have pockets of deprivation, but it is not caused by trade. It's caused by mechanization, robotics, AI, and other technological advance, which is a good thing. But, you know, Trump was, you used to see this during his presidency with, if you followed his Twitter, every other one was, oh, they're laughing at us on trade. We've got to reshore jobs, blah, blah. And then in between were all the other ones saying, best economy ever, stock exchange at a record high, lowest unemployment figures ever, people are living better. Right. Both of those things could not simultaneously be true. And it was the second that was accurate. The US economy was booming hugely because it was at that time more relatively more globalized than it has Oli, been. One more second. Only one second, please. We're going to finish uh, this segment with uh, two minutes. One minute uh, turns, followed by, by Daniel. Why was Karl Marx such an opponent of globalization. Karl Marx said, globalization will drive the living standards of ordinary people down to that of the poorest people and will therefore precipitate, precipitate revolution. Curiously, his prediction didn't come true. Why not? It turns out that the more intense the technology of your companies, the higher the wages. The reason that we did not descend to Karl Marx's horror is that the growth of technology meant that ordinary people working in companies got paid more and more and more. That's why Marx turned out to be wrong. If you undermine investment in technology by going for products that are made cheaply abroad, one way or another, you undermine equality within your country. And we have seen a huge diminution of equality in our country, and it's had the little consequences of our society. The last uh, I mean, Karl Marx, of course, was wrong about everything. The astonishing thing, given that he presented his theories not as political uh, precepts, but as scientific truths, is that all of them turned out to be nonsense. The revolutions didn't happen where he expected. The theory of immiseration was wrong. There wasn't this concentration of wealth. Even while he was writing, there was a massive expansion of the middle class and a rise in living standards. But he has cast a very long shadow because an awful lot of our intellectual elites on some level imbibed this stuff when they were students and haven't completely shaken it off. And the thing that they particularly haven't shaken off is the belief that the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer, which was, of course, central to Marxism, his, his theory of, of the concentration of wealth in the hands of the plutocracy. But that is not true. What is happening now globally is that the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting richer. And the reason that the rich and the poor are getting richer is because we have moved away from the illusion of self-sufficiency and we have come to understand that the way of being secure as well as better off is to source what you need from the widest possible variety of suppliers. A, so that you're not vulnerable to some local shock or disruption, which might as easily happen in your own country as anywhere else. And B, because that's how you maximize innovation, because you have the free flow of different ideas, what Matt Ridley would call ideas having sex with each other. And the more you do that on a global level, the quicker you drive the technological advance. Well, thank you both. Before we open the, the discussion uh, to the floor, we're going to deal with one more question. I will ask you both to please be as, as, as brief as you can. Um, is, uh, Terence, may I start with you? Uh, usually uh, nations that trade, usually they don't fight with each other. And also is, 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 it is the case that uh, trade benefits uh, the poorest in, in poor countries as well, so that uh, uh, they don't need to, uh, you know, emigrate to other other richer countries. So how do you address that question? Your position against trade? Norman Angel. I mean, Norman Angel, the Nobel laureate, and said exactly as you described, Germany and Britain would never go to war because we're so in mixed with each other and because of our trading relationship. It didn't work at all like that. And Adam Smith, by the way, also made exactly the same point, that trade can actually aggravate unhappiness among different people. The reality is, regardless of what Dan says, is that we would always have got richer and more technologically advanced, but the share of benefit has gone to the richer much more than to the ordinary folk because globalization has supported exactly the reasons I described. The world is getting less equal within nations, even as between nations, that is happening, you're getting richer. So poor countries are getting richer faster than rich countries are getting richer, which is a good thing. But within countries, you're seeing this increase in inequality within countries, which is caused by, keep on repeating myself, access to cheap labor. 
but sorry, um, um, just to clarify my question, but do you see that any connection between uh, uh, putting barriers on trade and fostering more uh, immigration from poorer countries? Do you see any connection whatsoever well, between we... the lower levels of trade and the need of people from other poorer countries in the world to emigrate to other richer parts of the world? What we absolutely want to stop is the business that in Britain alone, for example, there are huge numbers of people who could be employed in hospitals and nurseries and picking fruit, and that doesn't happen because we import cheap labour to do it instead. We destabilise society as a consequence, and yet we also commit people to long-term illness or long-term unemployment benefits. Immigration is altering our society in very dangerous ways by institutionalising the marginalisation of large numbers of the working classes. Your response? Well, I think that is mainly an argument about welfare and how it is that we have created a situation where we have nearly 5 million people on some measures not in work, admittedly not claiming unemployment benefit, but claiming an array of other incapacity benefits. Something has gone badly wrong when you can step off a plane from Bogota and walk straight into a job. Uh, and we have these these long-term unemployed. But I, I, to answer Juan's question about peace, I mean, as, as I said, of course, no one no one has found a way of guaranteeing peace. It is true that the European economies were integrated before 1914. Uh, peace is not always, uh, uh, war is not always a scramble for resources. It can start for all sorts of ideological uh, reasons or national conflicts. But I do believe that there is a clearly identified correlation. There was a, a book called Triangulating Peace that did this. But I actually just uh, last month, I watched Doug Irwin, whom you cite in your paper, speaking at the Mont Pelerin Society at Bretton Woods. And he showed actually what I think was a quite terrifying graph, which showed the growth of world trade uh, and then correlated it to the geopolitical situation of that time. And in very broad terms, Pax Britannica, the world is fairly stable. Britain has adopted unilateral free trade. People are getting richer and wars, although not eliminated, are relatively few. Then early 20th century, challenges to, to, to Britain, tariff, retaliatory tariffs in, tariffs in Britain, uh, and three decades of hellishness. The Holocaust, the Holodomor, the two world wars, the Depression. Then people get together in Bretton Woods in 1944 and say, we must stop this happening again. And one of the ways in which we will stop it happening again is by ensuring that there is a reduction in trade barriers, because the, the Bretton Woods conferees understood that the autocrats and the dictators were as much products of as advocates for autarky and protectionism. that They had come out of a, uh, an unstable system. And so for the next 70 years, we now had a Pax Americana and again, a, a stable and prosperous world as volumes of trade increased as a percentage of GDP up until about 2011. And that's why I say it was a rather scary graph. We are now going in the opposite direction. Volumes of trade globally are falling. And I do not believe that that can be decoupled from the political instability that we see, from what some uh, uh, political scientists are calling the cascade of wars. Uh, and I think that's going to get worse and worse. We just saw Venezuela making this extraordinary claim on a neighboring country. That's going to get worse and worse as just, just as when the unipolar British, the Pax Britannica ended, so we had protectionism and war. So I'm afraid we risk seeing the same thing with the end of the Pax Americana. We want to close with terrorists. It's exactly at the big round. What you saw by 1914, uh, Churchill described this rather well, was enormous pressures growing up because of the free trade world had caused such unhappiness and such inequalities within societies. You then explode in the First World War. And then in the 20s, we try to go back onto the gold standard. All the countries try to go back on the gold standard. We try to recreate trade. And the result is the collapse of the American financial market transmits to Germany and Austria and the election of Hitler. Um, the repeated story is not a free trade causing peace or responding to peace, but actually it's often being a consequence of what you've described. But the idea that free trade causes peace is just disputed, disproved by these repeated examples. Correlation is not the same as causation. We're going to enter the first part of the debate now. We're going to open to, to the floor for questions or comments. Yes, please. Yes, um, Bob. Well, basically, well, sorry, sorry, it's behind the, the gentleman in the back. Yes, yes, yourself. Can you? You're next. Would be next. Yes. Quick question. 
Uh, I, I would have liked to have heard a bit more about the unilateral element of the question. So, so I put it to, to the, the panel, should a country trade with a country that does not want to trade freely with it? Why should a country offer tariff-free trade in exchange for tariff-bearing trade? And it seems to me the obvious response to that is you surrender a bargaining chip uh, in a free trade agreement negotiation. Indeed, this was one of the reasons why the UK did not go for zero tariffs after Brexit. Because if you offer zero tariffs, why would any country open its markets to you? Because it's already getting everything. And I'm surprised that that, uh, that didn't sort of feature in the debate. I wonder, could someone say something? I want to ask you, uh, Daniel, please, since you are for the proposition to, to address the question. You're assuming that the big gain from trade is in exports. It's the, but but uh, as Adam Smith showed us, you know, before the American Republic was born, the great advantage of trade is falling prices, like cheaper imports, which mean that you have more resources to spend on everything else, which is what drives the growth of your economy. Again, this is counterintuitive. It, it doesn't sit well with our inherited Paleolithic instincts. But the, 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 uh, we didn't need to use the word unilateral when we had these debates in the 19th and early 20th centuries. That's what people understood by it. The protectionists at the beginning of the 20th century in this country, their uh, their slogan was retaliation. That's what that's what that's what they understood by protectionism, right? And the the uh, the, the reality is that uh, retaliation was retaliation in re in practice against their own consumers, against their own economy, because you make yourself poorer. So I think the the short answer to your question is, if the other country chooses to place rocks in its harbors, you don't respond by placing rocks in your harbors. Please. You are, of course, completely right. Um, and that's why every trade negotiation is mercantile. We don't live in a world of free trade. Free trade is a fantasy. The WTO and the negotiations that one country have are exactly as you describe. Okay, we'll let you export apples into our country, but we want to export jumpers into yours. We live in a completely mercantile world as we should. Adam Smith famously said the whole purpose of economic growth is consumption. But if you read on the next paragraph, he says, and the trouble with that is that because Britain is a corrupt country, various bad people have captured government and therefore have got various deals for themselves, and therefore uh, the consumption of the ordinary folk is destroyed by rich people taking money, the old corruption. That's why he said that. But you are absolutely right. The purpose of trade and economic activity is production out of which then wealth flows, which is why Smith and the Williamson uh, Washington Convention consensus said is the most ideal trade arrangements are honest mercantile. And it's only when you can't trust your politicians to be honest that you have to revert to... I can see how we are all better off if we have cheaper apples. How are we all better off because we're selling more jumpers to someone, right? We've just got to start thinking about what we actually mean by the advantages of trade and stop fretting about these deficits. There's no correlation between trade deficits and growth. I, I live in a little village on the Hampshire Berkshire borders. I have massive trade deficits with most of the pubs around me. Really big deficit with the Crown in Kingsclear, you know, with the Royal Oak in Overton, with the 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 the, the, uh, the White Hart, you know, the the the, the warship down. Sometimes do you know what they do? Sometimes they engage in dumping. Sometimes they offer me stuff at below production costs, like when they say free glass of wine with your meal on a Monday. What? Well, who gets the better end of that deal, right? Why on earth is it a problem to be importing stuff? Do you want to say anything else or shall we move on? No, to question. First of all, question. I, it was the gentleman in the second row here. Thank you. Um, what about the case of Hong Kong? Because I'm given to understand that Hong Kong in its early days didn't have tariffs. And it's actually uh, true to say that it was an early adopter of manufacturing in the 1960s. And uh, the second point I want to make is that uh, over the weekend on the GB News Camilla Tomini show, uh, a Tory MP who uh, won the award for Conservative MP of the Year has suggested or he's got uh, put forward the idea of labelling products and in the view of the agricultural industry, like beef, lamb. Is that protectionist? Who wants to start? Want to start? Okay. I, I'd be happy to answer that. Okay. If you look at my graph that everyone's got, you see Hong Kong's a huge outlier. It doesn't do research and development. 
So it is not an industrial nation, it's an entrepot. It, it, it does it by trade. It imports and exports, that's how it does things. Um, yes, of course, in the early ages, Hong Kong um, uh, sold, I mean, Hong Kong goods became fake. When I was young, Hong Kong goods were famous for being trashy. They were made by cheap labor and they were trashy. That's how Hong Kong grew. And now does it as an entrepot. So the example of Hong Kong would, would confirm the, the, the world as I see it. Let's, let's pause and honor the sainted memory of Sir John Cowperthwaite, who made Hong Kong the miracle it is by unilaterally adopting not just free trade, but low taxes and uh, light regulation. And I, I met him once late in life, and he said the great lesson about uh, deregulation is that doing nothing is a full-time occupation. You have to be there before the first of your officials arrives. You have to be there before, after the last of them has left. Otherwise, they will start doing stuff. And so to stop stuff happening, you have to be constantly on your guard. Well, you know, uh, if you want a, a, a memorial, look around you. What an extraordinary thing he achieved until the Chinese got their hands on it. Um, labeling, look, I'm perfectly okay with labeling. and I, I, it, Great. You know, whatever rules you have, fine. More information. But can we please stop pretending that this country depends on farming, particularly on lamb and beef, which are the, the bits of farming we do least well, right? To listen to Minute Batters and the National Farmers Union. First of all, you'd think that we are a massive agrarian economy. We're not. We are a big food importing country. And do you know what? We've been a net food importer since the 1720s. I can't help noticing we've done all right since the 1720s because we've moved up the, the production chain. But, do you know, with the bits of agriculture, we still do most of it. We're pretty good at, right? Our pigs, our poultry, our arable farming, that is pretty competitive by any standard worldwide. The bits that we're really bad at worldwide, guess what are the bits that we've tried to protect, i.e. particularly lamb and beef, which we didn't really do, particularly beef, we didn't really do it until we joined the EU, and then uh, we stopped being allowed to import it from Argentina and Canada and the US and Australia, so we created our own industry, which people now dig in and defend as though it's some immemorial part of the landscape. Most of it's from the 1970s. But we don't have to refight the Corn Laws, Stan. Um, sadly, we are in the middle of refighting the Corn Laws. All of these people now, and I have to say it's partly because some of them are so upset about Brexit. This is the, the weirdest psychological phenomenon that people who would normally be cosmopolitan, internationalist, and well aware of the arguments for unrestricted commerce now can't bring themselves to admit that any good has come out of leaving the European Union. And so when they talk about the trade deals with Australia, they start saying, oh, we're flooding our market with cheap food. Why did cheap become a, an insult, by the way? I say it's a great rich man's argument that, oh, we don't want this cheap stuff. Really? Let me just explain that. One minute, please. No, no, go, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. One minute, I said. Just... We, what we want is to trade with countries of the same wealth as ourselves. So we want EU trade is great. Trade with America is great. Trade with Australia, New Zealand, and Japan is great. All that's great. Um, what leaving the EU did for us was it took us out of our biggest market and took us out of a free trade zone and the currency. I mean, it was a disaster for us. And you are now throwing us into a global marketplace where we're having to do trade deals with Vietnam and China and places. It is a disaster for our economy, not in the short term, not even in, uh, in, in the sense of approaching technology because, in fact, we're finding ways around it. But Brexit was uniquely ill-conceived because it didn't understand that the ideal trading arrangement, as Schumpeter explained, was to be part of a block of about 200 million people, of people with your own GDP per capita, and you can then focus on growing everyone's wealth equally. And what you've done is you've thrown us out into a, a tough and un unfriendly world. We're not going to reopen the, the debate. Uh, we, have, <laughs> we have enough with free trade, you know, that's from free trade. Uh, so uh, please, um, Bruno, uh, Christian, and Dan, and then we, we need to close. Um, yeah. Thank you, Dennis, for coming to challenge us. I think you're the insurgent here. So we really appreciate it. It makes us think about our ideas. But I want to challenge you on the idea of government talking to business. So I've been a renewable energy entrepreneur for 35 years, and I ended up in this place because of what I learned about the supposed government talking to business what that actually means. It's rather like the misunderstood phrase, there's no such thing as society. There's no such thing as business. There's no thing that government goes and talks to and finds out what business thinks. There's just business men with interests. And the government goes and talks to whichever ones it can find, the ones that have the most resources to push themselves forward, the best connections. And then it backs the things that it thinks are right. It's maybe got some academics with their own axes to grind who 
with certain things. And if you're a business, you hope to God you're on their side. It's an absolute nightmare having government talking to business. The best thing that can happen to a business is government not to talk to them and to be responsible for its own future, for how it does, not only what it does in this country, but if it wants to take things abroad, how it does it. Will I export my ideas? Will I export the manufacturing? What will I do? Those are all things I would much rather be left to do than hand over to the government. Well, to, can we take the three questions uh, together and then respond to, together to the three of them? Otherwise, we wouldn't have time. I'm sorry, Terence. Uh, Christian and Daniel. Christian, behind you. A question for Terence too. Uh, you said once economies have access to cheap goods, cheap labor, they stop innovating because there's no incentive anymore. But through protectionism, you would create a captive market for uh, protected industries where um, I, I have to buy uh, maybe codes that I don't like or competition or well. If you have, if I operate in a captive market, where would be my incentive to innovate? The last one, please. Done. Uh, yeah, also for Terence. Um, you, your theory seems to be that uh, with globalization and free trade, you're inevitably going to get a continuous increase in, in inequality. Um, why is it that the level of inequality in Britain has remained basically the same since the early 1990s? Well, because, like, the, yeah, for, the very briefly, because I, I don't, so just to come to, uh, so Bruno's point, uh, let me answer Bruno's point by saying, what is the ideal? The ideal is, as Schumpeter described, an economy so big that there's plenty of internal competition, but sufficiently small that you can have democracy. That is an economy of the size of the United States of America. So trade is something, and so Schumpeter said, you don't need when you're such a big country, you don't need trade. Trade is what you have to do when you're too small to be completely self-sufficient. And so the answer to your question is uh, you try to make your trade arrangements as helpful as possible for that, you know, you have to do it with government. But recourse to government in trade is inevitable because we're dealing with sovereign states. I would agree with you, Bruno. If we lived in a country of 200 million people and that was self-sufficient, the government wouldn't involve itself in industry. But there'd be no need for government to involve in this industry. The only reason government has to involve itself in industry is we're dealing with other sovereign nations. It is the second best option. Trade is the second best option. The best option is to be part of a 200 million people block and have free trade within it. As for uh, Christian's point, look, Christian, you are of course quite right. The real problem is how do you liberate an, an infant industry when it's grown up? How do you, and that it just becomes a matter of political judgment. Madison in the Federalist Papers nearly 200 years ago described precisely this. And he said, the only way you can run trade if you're going to have trade is you have to have completely open discussion in parliament. That is the only way that all the interests can be exposed and Parliament can reach a collective decision. But trade is a second best option to a society in which you have a sufficiently large number of people that your market is subject to democratic forces. Because, and I come back to the wider point, we are dealing in a world now where people feel disempowered, you know, take back control and all that. We are feeling disempowered by trade that seems to have no interest in, in, in individuals which is why we're getting this populist reaction. To come back to your point specifically, we have to manage consciously, uh, as the way someone like Mrs. Thatcher might have done, uh, liberating uh, infant industries once they have grown up. And that's a tough political decision, but it can be done. Uh, and Daniel's point, Daniel's from my... Daniel, yeah. What was it? Yeah. Um, why it has inequality grown? Oh, well, that's because... I'll tell you why it hasn't. Because between 1970 and 1990, it grew by like 10%. Between 1970 and 1990, across the OECD, unemployment rates rose from about 3% to 8%. That was the initiation of globalization. And since globalization, between 73 and 90, as I said earlier, the share of national income going to working class people fell by 10% of GDP, and the share going to um, uh, labor uh, capital rose by 10%. And it's been maintained ever since. So the answer to question is, all the bad things happened at the beginning of globalization, and we've been stuck with them ever since. You want to say anything? No, not in no, Those were all for Terence. Okay. Before we uh, we call for, for a vote, uh, yeah, well, if you want to, you can have a couple of minutes each just to summarize your position, and then we'll call for a vote. Please, we'll just start. Why is it more? Do you want to? Okay. Do you feel it'd be inclusive? I start from first principles. You got something that you want to sell, I want to buy it. By what right does the government come between us and declare our transaction to be illegal? 
I'm not saying that there are no circumstances where that can ever happen. I'm just saying that we should approach the question, uh, as the prayer book says of marriage, reverently, discreetly, advisedly, soberly. Right? You should be very careful before prohibiting a uh, a transaction between two willing and knowing individuals. And the only argument, all I'm saying is that we we should extend that beyond borders. We shouldn't be xenophobic in our partial application of the general principle of property rights, free contract, and the right of individuals to trade. And I, I really do feel the, the onus is on the other side to show what is so dangerous about foreigners or about foreign goods, because all of it comes down to that. I want to say, since I'm closing, that I think it's, it's very decent of Terence to have come here, because this is about the and, and he's, of course, been very charming and very eloquent as always. But he's he's done so in front of possibly the only pro free trade audience that you'll find in this country. Almost anywhere else, he would be uh, wildly popular because, as I say, people begin with their hunches, they begin with their instincts. You are, if you like, all very unusual in this room in that you've thought about it, uh, and and you've therefore uh, you've therefore been able to move beyond some of the caveman intuitions that you began with. But I just leave you with the thought that. Uh, free trade is a terrific way of bringing people together. Uh, Voltaire said of the London Stock Exchange, it's extraordinary. Here you see the Christian, the Mohammedan, and the Jew doing business, and the only person they call infidel is the one who can't pay his debts. He said, what an extraordinary thing that these people, who would in any other situation be arguing, are innocently engaged in enriching one another. Well, isn't that something that we could do with a little bit more of in the world? I can't think of a better way of getting people who don't get along to get along than through voluntary transactions that, by definition, enrich both parties. And I would not be so mean-minded as to confine that behind the borders of a single state. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. You're two minutes. I am going to start from first principles as well. But first, thank you for patronizing me, and thank you for me. <laughs> and thank you for praising your audience. Very clever strategy. Um, <laughs> the quote you make was the London Stock Exchange. It was all the uh, yeah. It was absolutely not about trade internationally or globally. I start from first principles, and my first principle is this: the unit of economic activity is the nation state, and the reason for that is quite simply that the unit of economic activity is determined by the laws. You don't have markets in the absence of laws, so it is the nation state that determines the laws. Within the nation state, it gets richer through new technology. That is the story of the last 300 years. We live in a world that's enriched by technology. Technology can substitute for cheap labor. If you live in a country where labor has become so expensive thanks to a Smithian revolution, that now you've got to invent better tools so that you can, in a sense, defeat the cost of labor because the workers are so rich then that's fantastic. But if you can undermine the workers by importing cheap goods from abroad, then you undermine your own country. And there's a philosophical difference between Dan and I. Dan talks about the right of two individuals to make a contract. I deny that right, curiously. Curiously. I actually think it's the nation states who make the contracts between themselves. Within the nation state, yes, of course, the two individuals. But because the unit of economic activity is the nation state, it has to be the nation state. And we should not, this is where I finish, we should not negotiate away the standards of living of our people just so that um, goods can be cheaper and undercut to basically benefit the rich and the benefit of the poor. Thank you, Terence. So, now, the vote. So, those in favour uh, of the proposition that uh, the UK should embrace unilateral free trade, please raise your hand. <laughs> Yeah, four, one, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, eight, ninety. If I'm right, <laughs> those against the proposition. <laughs> Nineteen in favour, uh, ten against. <laughs> so, uh, may I, before we finish, uh, may I say that well, we're going to have a drinks reception uh, right after this in the Wilson Room. Uh, may I thank again the, the IA for hosting this event. They are great partners, and I'm really appreciative of how much they, they help the Vincent Centre at the University of Buckingham. And may I thank uh, our speakers uh, tonight. It's been a privilege uh, to be there with uh, to be here with them. 
and we need to discuss these topics uh, much more. I couldn't be more uh, uh, thankful for for your contribution to the to the debate. And thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you.